This is my conversation with Jacques Distler. Jacques is a theoretical physicist who studies high energy theory and string theory. He's worked at a number of universities, including Harvard, Princeton, and UT Austin. In our conversation, we discuss what string theory actually is, quantum computing and how it works, whether or not we live in a simulation, and even more naturally, uh, the true meaning of life. I hope that you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. Why don't we start off and you can just talk a little bit about your background, how you got into physics in the first place, okay, and why you chose string theory in the specific oh, the areas. Whole, that the whole in. thing, okay. Whole so, thing. yeah, so um, I grew up in uh, Montreal, uh, went off to college in the States at age 17, and I've been moving south ever since. Um, <laughs> so I went to uh, undergraduate and graduate school in Boston, uh, postdoc at Cornell in upstate New York, and then I was... Uh, an assistant professor at Princeton for five years, and then we moved down here. Um, so I was always interested in physics way back from, I mean, when I was knee high. Uh, um, uh, I think, um, so my mom was a biochemist. Okay. Um, and she decided that there were lots of questions she could answer this inquisitive young child, but physics was not one of them. Just, so yeah. she bought me some, like, popular books to, okay. you know, so I could read and like answer my own questions mm -hmm. and I just fell in love and okay. that was that. Um, so this is what age, like middle oh school? Lord, yeah, middle something? school, okay. the, even like late elementary school, like fifth, sixth grade. That's pretty like early. That. Really I remember early. I had my physics class in like middle school and mm -hmm. we, st we did the things where you'd like build like a trebuchet and like all that kind uh -huh. of stuff, the egg drop. Uh, yeah, uh, experiment, yep. all that stuff. That's kind of what sparked my interest, um, but that's awesome. Yeah, no, so, um, it, it, and actually one of my big formative uh, experiences, I had a elementary school teacher who, like, recognized something in me, and her brother was a physics professor at University of British Columbia, and whenever he came to visit his sister, he he would go off for like an afternoon and come visit and chat with me. Mm. This like sixth grader, okay? Uh, I don't know, I mean, that's just like above and beyond. Uh, I uh, I don't know like why or how, but anyways, that, that really, um, you know, got me down, down this road. Sure. And so I decided I wanted to do physics. I majored in physics as an undergrad, got to graduate school and I, was working in, I mean, what I still call high energy theory. Um, and midway through graduate school, string theory came along in this kind of tidal wave. Uh, and a bunch of us graduate students and postdocs decided we were going to learn this subject because none of the faculty were interested. Right, OK. Uh, and, and so we just got, got together. We got some notes from. Uh, uh, a class that had been taught at Princeton a semester before, and we just got together and, and decided we would learn this subject. Um, and it was a fantastic experience because there was no one, you know, looking over our shoulder. It was just us. Sure. And um, so that's what we ended up doing. I ended up writing my PhD dissertation in that topic. And Do you find that older generations of academics in general are like not open to groundbreaking like total mindset shifts or do you think that's not the case like why right out the bat you're saying most of the professors weren't very interested well this was most of, so the notes that we got were from uh the nobel laureate david gross from princeton he was of this older generation and he decided you know this was hot stuff and he was going to learn it and and teach a course on it um so um, it's not universally true. Um, my PhD supervisor rather famously was like totally not interested, but he would let his students do anything they wanted. Okay. So, 
you know, if he thought you were good, just go off, do your thing, come talk to me if you want, uh, but, you know, I'm not going to micromanage what you do. Uh, and so that was great. Um, you know, we got to, we got the run of the, the, <laughs> of the zoo. <right? laughs> totally. Yeah. Okay. So what, okay. yeah. Okay. So just to, 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 to catch up. So I got my, my PhD, went on to a postdoc, um, then, you know, got a, a job here and ended up here eventually. Um, and I've been here since 1994. Okay. So, yeah, get, getting, getting on there, 30, yeah. almost 30 years. Um, and it's been great. So, again, I don't really think of myself primarily as a string theorist, even though that's most of what I do. I mean, I think of myself as a high-energy theory person, and I'm interested in all aspects of that, and I just happen to spend most of my time doing string theory inspired or string theory related things. So. Okay. So can you explain kind of broadly what string theory is? Great question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so the first thing to understand is that if you want to put together quantum mechanics and special relativity, that's extremely constraining. Um, it's very hard to fit them together in a consistent way. And when you do, everything at low energies turns out looks like what's called a quantum field theory. Okay? Um, this is something that I think Steve Weinberg, who used to be the Nobel laureate down the hall here, uh, 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 proved back in the day. Um, and so everything looks like that. And so that's what I, quote unquote, grew up with. I mean, it's a little older. You know, uh, that, that, that's kind of the bedrock of our field. Mm -hmm. um, and most people sort of believe that if you have something that looks like a quantum field theory at low energies, it's going to look like a quantum field theory at all energies, if, or it's inconsistent in some way. And what string theory is, is something which looks like a quantum field theory at low energies, but its high energy behavior is completely different. It's described, it, it has... Instead of in a quantum field theory, it has where you have a finite number of propagating degrees of freedom, it has an infinite number of propagating degrees of freedom. And for that to be consistent, their, their interactions have to be adjusted just so. And this leads to all sorts of magical properties of the, of the theory, which you wouldn't get in, in any quantum field theory. Um, another aspect of that is that most string theories, in fact, once upon a time I used to think all, we used to think all string theories had to include gravity. So in other words, not just quantum mechanics and special relativity, but quantum mechanics and general relativity. Mm -hmm. um, and so, depending on your point of view, that's great because one of the things you'd like to understand is quantum gravity, and here's this formalism which requires that you include gravity. It's not, not even consistent without it. Well, turns out we've learned in recent years that that's not completely true. There are certain string theories called little string theories which don't include gravity. So, you know, every statement I make, there's some exception, right? But they still have this kind of infinite number of degrees of freedom at high energy, which make their behavior at high energy very different from ordinary quantum field theories. Um, so that's what string theory is. It, it's this kind of alternative high energy behavior for theories that are consistent with quantum mechanics and relativity, um, but are not quantum field theories. So uh, from, from my like preliminary kind of research, mm -hmm. it seems like one of the biggest critiques with like a lot of the string theory is this idea that there is a sort of like uni unification, like ability like a, you know what I mean? Like a general unification of like a set of, that explains everything, I guess, like all of the uh, right. global constants, all that kind yeah. of stuff. Yeah. So I guess like what is, if you had to make the best argument you could against string theory, what would that be? So the thing about, I gave a lecture, I think, uh, uh, I, I pointed you to some, some lecture notes for, from that lecture, where I distinguished two kinds, two notions of, two uses of the word theory, 
right? One of them is like a, a, a specific thing where you have some phenomena in the real world and this is a scheme which explains those phenomena and predicts the numbers that come out when you do experiments. Mm -hmm. And then the other, the second kind of theory is a kind of a language or a framework for formulating theories of the first kind. So like an example of the first kind of theory is what we call the standard model, which explains all the particle physics that we know about, you know, all the particles and their interactions. And, gives very precise predictions for what people see at accelerators and whatnot. It works beautifully. That's, so that's a particular quantum field theory, right? Very particular one that's called the standard model, right? But okay. then there's quantum field theory in general. And of course, and there are infinite number of possible quantum field theories, most of which don't describe anything in nature that we see, right? But they're, it's, like I said, a language. Sort of like an interface versus yeah. like a implementation exactly. of a class like right. within right. computer right. science. Right. So um, you can think about string theory both ways, right? And in okay. particular, what you'd like is since it's a theory that, you know, includes gravity and, you know, gauge theory interactions and blah, 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 all of the ingredients you know are present in the real world, you'd like the version of string theory that reproduces the real world subsumes the standard model and maybe tells you a bunch of new stuff, like what's the mass ratio between the electron and the muon and all kinds of other stuff that ought to pop out of such a complete theory. Um, we don't have that. There was a huge amount of optimism back in the late 80s okay. that that was right around the corner, right? That we were, you know, just a few more years, do a little bit more work, we were gonna be golden. And it didn't pan out that way. Uh, um, I think we're still pretty far from finding the solution to string theory out of which, you know, the real world emerges. Right? So if we were able to hypothetically find two things. One, do you think it's possible to find kind of the true theory or do you think it's sort of asymptotic and we're only ever gonna get closer? And then the second part of that is, if we were able to, what would we actually be able to glean from that? Like, w what okay, influence right. would that have? So, so you, you might say, well, like, why did we run out of steam in the 90s? Or, I mean, you can say, try to pin down exactly when we ran out of steam. Um, and, and I think that the answer is that, you know, there are various regimes in string theory where, where various approximations are valid. And I think the real world, you know, the universe we see, lies in one of those regimes where it's hard to calculate stuff, okay? So what people have been doing all this time is refining their tools, right? Developing that language, that theory of type two, right? So that you have the, the tools, the computational ability to compute stuff that you couldn't do before and hopefully, ultimately apply it and find you know, the real world lurking in there, right? Um, so that's what people have been doing um, in, in a sense that describes a lot of what I've been, been, been doing. Um, uh, but it's a pretty hard road uh, and I, do, I don't know when we'll succeed in, in you know, actually, you know, computing anything in, in the, that, you know, reproduces the standard model in every aspect and tells you more. Um, I don't, uh, I mean, I, I'm sure we'll do it someday, uh, uh, okay. but um, I, I don't know when that's gonna happen because it, uh, like I said, it, the stuff we need is hard. Got you. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you, this is a little more abstract, I guess. Yeah. Um, so would you agree that in kind of an isolated environment, completely isolated, like we could theoretically predict like particle movement, particle, like, you know, given right. the parameters we know, we could project like in the future where that particle be, will be or Great. what it's going to be doing? Great question. And the answer is sort of no. Sort and, of no. And let me explain this. So um, in, in, in quantum mechanics, there's something called the state, the, the quantum state of a system. So mm -hmm. let's talk about an isolated system. 
And the quantum state of the system evolves completely deterministically. For an isolated system, it evolves according to something called Schrodinger's equation. Sure. Okay? So, brilliant. Okay, that evolves completely deterministically. The stuff we measure, the observables, you talked about the position of the particle, all, all these observables, that, those things quantum mechanics only gives probabilistic answers for. Right. And so the, the state of the system tells you what the probabilities for observing various things are. Um, but even though that evolves deterministically, it's just a probability. It's just giving you a probability distribution. It's not giving you the actual values for when you measure those things. Mm -hmm. So that's a fundamental impediment. Um, if, if I hand you that isolated system and ask you to figure out what's, what's going on in it and then predict what it'll do in the future, it a fundamental impediment is you can't yeah. measure the state of the system. You can only measure the observables, and the state's only giving you a probability distribution for those, not the state right. itself. Right. So it's, it, it, it's a very tricky situation that we are stuck with because quantum mechanics really is what describes the real world. So can you talk a little bit about like quantum entanglement then and how this kind of translates towards... like? Uh, quantum computing, because yeah. that's like fundamentally right. That yeah. prob probabilistic distribution is yeah. kind of that underlying idea. Yeah. With so, yeah. it, it, what the thing I like to contrast entanglement with is is correlation. See, correlation is very simple to to understand. We see it classically all the time. So, I I'll give a simple example. I take a piece of paper, tear it in two, crumple the two halves into balls and hand one at random to Bob and the other to Alice, okay? Now, they go off and they uncrumple the paper and 50% chance Bob got the top half, 50% chance he got the bottom half. Mm -hmm. But we know that if Bob got the top half, then Alice got the bottom half and vice versa, right? So that's correlation, right? Mm -hmm. they're, they're, we only know what they're gonna measure probabilistically, 50% chance of each possibility. But and once we know one, you know we know one. the other. Right. Bingo, okay? Entanglement is more subtle than that, okay? That's the, okay. That's the thing that, 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 that we need to explain. So, so let me switch from um, pieces of paper to photons, okay? So top half, bottom half, we'll talk about uh, a, a photon polarized along the x-axis or versus polarized along the y-axis. If you want to measure that, you don't unfold the piece of paper. You uh, send it through a Polaroid filter, right? Okay. If, depending on how you align the filter, the photon either makes it through or it gets absorbed. Right? Okay. So we know how to measure po the polarization, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Okay. So again, I can prepare I can prepare two photons, right? And you know, send one of them off to Bob and one of them off to Alice. Now they can be far apart during the whole uh, process. And I'll, I'll, ha I'll, I'll, I'll arrange things so that if Bob measures his photon to be polarized in the x direction, then Alice measures hers to be polarized in the y direction and vice versa. Okay, so 50% chance Bob got the x polarized guy, 50% that he got the y polarized guy. But once we know which one he got, we know, what, we know which one Alice got. Mm -hmm. Okay, so far so good. Sounds like I'm just repeating myself Sure. Right. Yeah. Okay. But now we do something tricky. Instead of measuring the X, the put, aligning our Polaroid filters with the X axis or the Y axis, we align them at a 45 degree line. Okay. Okay. Great. So um, what does Bob see? Well, now Bob has a 50% chance that the. Um, uh, that the photon gets through the, the Polaroid filter, regardless of whether it was X or Y polarized. Um, so you can verify this, just if you're willing to sacrifice a couple of pairs of sunglasses, you can set up you know, Polaroid filters. So take two crossed filters like this, nothing gets through, mm -hmm. right? Take a third filter and put it in between the two at 45 degrees, and now half of the light gets through. Okay. Okay, easy thing. Check it at home, okay? Sure. Great, okay. 
So now, uh, same experiment, only but now Bob and Alice measure the things at 45 degree angles rather than like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So 50% chance that Bob's photon gets through, 50% chance Alice's photon gets through. You might think the chance that both of them get through is 25%. You know, a half times a half mm -hmm. is a quarter. That's true in the correlated state. In the entangled state, it's 50%. In other words, if Bob's gets through, then Alice's gets through. And if Bob's gets absorbed, Alice's gets absorbed. Mm. Takes a while for that to sink in, okay? But sure. it, 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 that, so you, you need to be able to do these sort of slightly different measurements, a different observable, this thing at 45 degrees rather than horizontal or vertical. Mm -hmm. in order to detect the difference between the correlated state and the entangled state, okay? And huh. that's the, the kind of special thing about entanglement, which is not only really hard to explain, I just went on for five minutes, just even setting up the statement of what you were supposed to see. Right. I didn't even like really tell you, like, like pull back the curtain and say like what it was that I arranged. That's a whole different thing. But just the statement of what you see that lets you tell the difference between entangled versus correlated took you know, a while for me to explain. Um, uh, 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 it, it, that's why the subject is so subtle, right? Just even being able to explain what the difference is takes a bit of thought. Sure. So f for quantum computing then does that depend on the particles being entangled yeah so 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 let's talk about computing in general right okay okay so computing in general what you've got it uh, first of all let's describe a classical computer so a classical computer has a bunch of bits mm -hmm. right each of which is either zero or one right and then you have a bunch of logical gates right with the operations on these bits Right, so you prepare the thing with some input string of bits, you go through these operations, and then you measure the, the, the end result, which is, again, a string of bits, mm -hmm. right? Okay, that's classical computer computation, you know. Um, okay, so uh, in a quantum computer, we replace bits by qubits. So a qubit, a single qubit, um, is essentially a point on the surface of a sphere. So to a pair of angles, latitude and long longitude. Right, okay. like a linear combination, right? right. Well, the point is it, it's not just zero or one, it's, it's, it's any some pair of angles, right. right? So it sounds like it's a huge improvement over just a bit, which only takes on two values, right? Mm -hmm. and, and if I have n qubits, then it's, you know, two to the n minus two numbers mm -hmm. that you have to specify to specify the state of n qubits. So it's exponentially more information. Right. right. It just sounds like paradise, right? Right, right, right. But when you measure the, and now you send it through a set of quantum gates, mm -hmm. right? You prepare the initial state of your qubits, you send them through a bunch of quantum gates, and then you measure the output. The final, the output. Sure. But now when you measure, we run into this problem that it we described before. It's only pro <laughs> you only get probably you only get zero or one. Right. And you only and the quantum state only gives you a probability distribution for which you get. Right. Okay. So Okay. So so we need to be really clever now to have arranged things so that the, the, the right answer has a probability that approaches one. And all of the myriad of wrong answers have probabilities that approach zero. Mm -hmm. Okay. There are some problems, but r relatively speaking, very few problems for which that's possible. In other words, for which a quantum computer offers any kind of speed up versus a classical computer. Mm -hmm. Okay. Factoring large integers is one of those problems. Right. Um, the the the. To my mind, the most interesting one is simulating other quantum systems. 
Okay. Okay. So, so that's a lot more applicable to like real world systems. Well, if you right? want to do chemistry, you know, you're simulating quantum systems, you know, atoms, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And molecules and stuff, right? And, and so simulating quantum systems is really hard on a classical computer, but easy on a quantum computer. Uh, and so you can get the kind of s speed up that you'd like uh, 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 there. Um, but kind of most problems in quotation marks, quantum computer offers absolutely no speed up. And you know, for logistical reasons, it's probably even slower than a classical computer. Sure. Um, right. The one, yeah, the one I've heard about a lot um, application that seems really scary is like encryption, right? And like you were saying with factoring right. numbers. For factoring. Yeah, so there are now a whole bunch of you know, post-quantum cryptography schemes. Right? And what's going to happen is as quantum computers kind of progress and are actually able to factor large integers, um, we're going to stop using all the encryption. Crypt encryption schemes that rely on those classically hard problems right. and replace them with other encryption schemes. Hopefully, we've covered all of our bases by then, um, you know, which are still hard on a quantum computer. Right? Mm -hmm. And as I said, in some sense, most problems are hard on a quantum computer. There are only a few that are easy. Okay. And we just need to avoid using the ones that are sure, easy. Sure, sure. Do you think that, I mean, that sounds like a tough transition, right? To it's get fine. all of the encryption moved over to different yeah. systems. Um, you, you've heard of the 2038 problem? I don't think I'm familiar with that. Oh, okay. You, you, you remember the Y2K problem? That yeah. was a piece of cake compared to right, the 2038 right, right, right. problem. Okay, so the 2038 problem is that every Unix system, including the computer you're recording this one on, uh -huh. um, uh, records time as seconds from the epoch, which was some, mm -hmm. some instant in 1972, 19. I think. Right. Um, with uh, 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 32-bits, you run that out. You run out in 2038. Okay. So every computer system that hasn't been upgraded then is going to go berserk in 2038. Okay. Um, and, and when and you know there are microprocessors in every goddamn thing now, right? Okay. Yeah. And almost all of them. Or 32. Are, you know, it's not that they're 32-bit operating systems. It's that the software that measures time, you know, that you know, there's a time stamp in, on just about everything, measures it, it with, it records it as a 32-bit integer measured from the epoch, and that's going to go berserk in 2038. So it, it, there are lots of problems facing us, uh, and. Yes, you know, uh, um, the RSA and all of those classical encryption routines that are going to be broken by quantum computers are just one of a myriad of problems that we're <laughs> going to run into. I, I think 2038 is going to come before the quantum, you, you, quantum computing breaks all classical encryption. I think 2038 is going to be, be there first, and it's going to be bigger because it's not just the encryption that breaks. But it's every damn thing in your computer or your toaster oven or whatever else has a microprocessor in it. So what do you think like what do you think will happen? Do you think we'll have a solution before then? I sure hope so. Or you're just gonna have I to sure repla so. replace everything you own? Pre <laughs> I mean you're gonna have to replace a lot of stuff you own. You may do it over hopefully over several years so that right, everything right. is up to date by the time you know, that 32-bit integer overflows, but it, it, almost everything is going to need to be replaced. Yeah. <laughs> Jeez. So, okay. So it sounds like with quantum computing, then it's sort of like it's, you don't think it's going to be some like change the world, like everything changes. It's going to be great for quantum chemistry. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a big thing for cryptography because we're going right. to have to shift over to a whole different set of cryptogra cryptographic routines. But I think that's not such a big problem. Um, I, 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 you know, it, it, are you ever going to have a quantum computing chip on your phone? 
Probably not, because I don't think there's any problem that you want to solve on your phone that's going to be amenable to that quantum speed up. I could be wrong, but you know, it seems to me kind of unlikely right. that you're going to be doing like quantum chemistry on your phone. Gotcha. Okay, so this is kind of switching lanes a little yeah. bit. Um, so why exactly is there a breakdown between um, like quantum physics and general re relativity when you get to that threshold of, I forget, like 10 to the negative 35, that scale or whatever, right. where it stops? Like, why is that the so case? That's, so that's where quantum gravity becomes strong. Okay, so gravity... I mean, you probably don't have that sense sitting in this room, but gravity is an incredibly weak force. Mm -hmm. Okay, the only reason why you're still sitting in that chair instead of floating in the air is because the Earth is really big and gravity is additive, <laughs> right? So there's this huge big mass pulling you down and, and rooting you in that chair. Otherwise, you just float away, mm -hmm. okay? It, gravity is incredibly weak at, at low energies, um, but because it's cumulative, it can have a big effect. If the mass, is big, the enough. mass is big enough, right? Um, at very high energies, it becomes strong even when you don't have a big mass around. Um, and so that's when, you know, the sort of, so I have to have a foil, like I have to have something that kind of works for a while and then breaks down at that scale. So there's an approach to quantum gravity, which I like to emphasize is completely effective at low energies called the effective field theory expansion. There's a bunch of buzzwords, but just it, th there's an approach that's a systematic expansion that, you know, approximation scheme that you can grind through, you know, to any order of approximation you want that works at low energies very nicely but just breaks down when you get to the you know, Planck energy, right? right? Uh, and needs to be replaced with something else. Uh, and that's where sort of string theory comes in because it gives you, I like to say one of the only two options for a consistent replacement for that effective field theory expansion, which just breaks down. Um, there's something else called asymptotic safety that I can talk a little bit about, uh, uh, which is in principle an alternative to string theory, um, which keeps making sense once you get to those energies and beyond. Um, uh, but, it, I mean, the leading candidate, aside from that, the leading candidate is definitely string theory, which definitely does make sense, you know, to arbitrarily high energies. Got you. Okay, and then, so what is the difference really between string theory and like loop quantum gravity? So loop quantum gravity, there are, there are actually two completely distinct things that okay. are called loop quantum gravity. Um, okay. they, they don't really distinguish them, but they really are distinct. So um, there's what they call canonical loop quantum gravity, and there's what they call spin foams, okay? So spin foams are really a, a kind of version of this asymptotic safety thing that, that, that I described. I can say in more technical terms how they're a version of that, but if you think about them, that, that's really what, what they're doing. Um, and that, I think, in, in principle, could work. I mean, it's not, like, obviously wrong. The canonical quantum gravity guys, what they, they, uh, seem to think that the problem is that people chose the wrong variables. And if you chose the right variables, everything would fall into place um, and, and it would all work magically, beautifully perfect. Um, and, and that's just not true. Um, if you were able to work hard enough and get to the place where people run into trouble with this effective field theory expansion, Canonical loop quantum gravity would run into exactly the same, the same troubles. Um, in point of fact, they, they, they take a wrong turn at, at a certain point. Um, that, like, now we're starting to get into the weeds, but they, they take a, a wrong turn at, uh, turn at a certain point, and they never get that far. 
Um, but if they did it right and they got that far, they'd run into exactly the same problems. Mm -hmm. um, and and the, you either, so in string theory, like I said, you have this infinite number of propagating degrees of freedom that start appearing at, at very high energies. Uh, in, um, what do you mean exactly by that? Well, it, it just the number of particle species. There's not one or five or 15. There's an infinite tower of, of particles of ever higher mass. Okay. Okay. And it just goes on forever. Okay. Sure. It's li literally an infinite tower okay. and with, with interactions that are very carefully adjusted so that, y you know, the, it has beautif beautifully well constrained properties at high energies. Um, it behaves much better at high energies than you had any right to expect. And that's what makes it not break down where the effective field theory approximation, which always had a finite number of particles describing everything, breaks down. Right? So one alternative to, is to just add this infinite tower of new particles. Uh, and the other alternative is, uh, as I said, something, I'll use the phrase, an ultraviolet fixed point is what the, the buzzword in physics is, and that that controls the high energy behavior. Um, so those are, I think, the two alternatives to fixing up the effective field theory expansion, um, and those are really the only two alternatives, and so you're either doing one or you're doing the other, um, whether or not you realize it or not. Sure, okay. Completely separate question. Sure. Um, can you talk a little bit about like wormholes and like conceptually like what that is both like mathematically and more on the like just conceptually? So general relativity allows all kinds of crazy solutions. Uh, and there are, if you allow for suitably exotic forms of matter sometimes, sometimes not so exotic, um, uh, there are solutions where um, there are shortcuts from point A to point B. You don't have to go the long way. You, there's a shortcut through a wormhole. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, uh, as I said, in order to, to um, actually support, you know, a, a, a wormhole, you may need to introduce sort of, you know, exotic forms of matter to serve as sources for the gravitational field, to, you know, to, to, for, for that wormhole to be stable. Um, and such exotic forms of matter may not actually exist in the real world, but exist in your toy world that mm -hmm. you're playing around with. Um, but, you know, that they're none the, nonetheless, you can contemplate such things and Write down so if you solutions. had to put your money on whether they're real and exist out there or not, what would you say? Probably not in, with the matter content of our world uh, and, and whatnot, probably not. But, um, you know, like I said, I spend most of my time thinking about things that aren't our world, but are generalizations of it. So I'm happy to contemplate. You do, you, do, you, do we have like real learnings that we get even from these concepts, even though they're not necessarily real? Well, so again, I mean, you're trying to sharpen your tools. And the way you do that is by, you know, using them in all sorts of circumstances Education. that don't necessarily describe the real world you're interested in, but variants where certain features of the formalism appear most readily and you know, you can explore those features. Um, so, you know, lots of people like studying field theories in different numbers of dimensions, right? You know, we live in four dimensions, three space, one time, mm -hmm. right? But why not study, you know, three dimensions or five or whatever, right? Um, some things are simpler there. It's easier to understand. There are exotic phenomena that, that crop up, say in low dimensions that don't appear in high dimension. You learn things by doing that. And sometimes it turns out to be really useful because our condensed matter friends, the experimentalists, are very uh, uh, 
able to construct systems that act like they have two spatial dimensions, sort of thin film mm. systems, right? Those are described by, in suitable search terms, quantum field theories in two space-time dimensions instead of four. So if you spent all your time in four space-time dimensions and never you thought about that one, you, you'd yeah. miss out on, 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 on that stuff, right? So do you think that there are more than four dimensions? Yeah. Okay. Uh, not for not more than four big ones, okay. but but yeah, I mean, I I, I think the real I, I I actually do believe the real world is probably described by some ver version of string theory, and so there are more than 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 four okay. dimensions. In, in any case, it's super useful to be able to study string theory in the abstract right. with whatever number of dimensions it has, and you know learn stuff. Sometimes I spend most of my time learning stuff about four-dimensional field theory by studying higher-dimensional constructions in string theory. That's kind of my personal bread and butter. Gotcha. Yeah, I, I wonder, yeah. I, this kind of makes me think, like, if, if there are life forms that exist that can kind of comprehend either diff a different set of dimensions than us or or more just in general so like it's kind of like the the example i see a lot of where they take like an ant and then they right. put the ant on like on the straw right right yeah, right so it's that kind of thing so do you think so hypothetically for a moment let's assume that there are more than four do you think that any of the life that we know of and recognize as life can sense or comprehend a different set than us or do you think like probably any anything that we consider life based on the set of qualities that we say that is a living organism that all of those organisms exist only within these four dimensions so like the example of the ant on a straw right um, you need to be small enough to be able to detect these extra dimensions because they're presumably rather small, right? Like the cross section of the straw, the circle mm -hmm. cross section of the straw, right? So if you're too big, you just see it as one dimensional in the same way that we see our space here as, as three dimensional. If we were small enough, maybe we'd, we would be able to detect the, the other really small dimensions. Now, of course, things that are small enough well, I mean, you have to be really small. The smallest mm -hmm. things we, we, which are barely alive, are viruses, right? I say barely alive because you know they really rely on larger organisms to reproduce. They're not self-reproducing themselves. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know what the the internal life of a virus is like. But <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's probably not that interesting. Um, I don't know. After twenty twenty, it <laughs> seems kind of interesting. <laughs> Um, but but it, it, even viruses would be really huge on the scale that uh, I would think the extra be necessary. Are, right, right. Yeah. Okay. So interesting. So basically, it could be, but we probably can't even really detect. Yeah, probably not. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. All right. So with regards to black holes, mm -hmm. um, so the. the the reason our current theories kind of break down at singularities is because the sort of space they occupy kind of asymptotically is, is like is zero, right? Mm -hmm. And we don't have that like concept. Like, but we obviously we know they're real at this point. So like would do you have any theories in terms of what's actually going on or or what what can we explain there, and what are we are we making progress to understand that more, or do you think that just would require like a like a no? Totally I think there's a lot. Of, there's a lot of pressure. So let's let's talk about black holes for a second. So there okay. are two kind of sca scales in a, in a black hole. There's there's the size of the horizon. So the horizon basically separates the stuff that can never conceivably escape. get out from the stuff that can never escape. Right, 
And um, if you happen to be near a black hole horizon and you're um, just freely falling, um, you'd never know it. I mean, we might be inside a black hole horizon at this moment, and we'll only discover, you know, millions of years from now that our fate is sealed. Right. Um, we can't escape. Well, not we, but, you know, our progeny, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, can't escape. Um, uh, but, you know, we don't know it because the horizon presumably is very big, and the curvature of space-time near the horizon is very small, and everything looks no totally normal to us. Mm -hmm. right? Near the center of the black hole, near the, the so-called singularity, there things are different. There the curvature blows up and the classical general relativity, the formalism in which all the previous statements were just made, breaks down, right? And you really need to replace it by some quantum gravity theory, right? Um, and so that, um, uh, uh, there are some things I know how to address within the only quantum gravity theory that I really know how to deal with, string theory. There are some aspects of black holes that I can address, um, but there are other aspects that I don't really know. I know in principle, but don't really have a controlled calculation to, to actually do. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that Stephen Hawking late Stephen Hawking, you know, showed was that black holes, and this is what makes the whole subject kind of fraught, black holes evaporate quantum mechanically, right? Um, and so if I have a black hole, it'll, it'll, it's a big black hole, it'll take a very long time, but uh, uh, it, it will emit radiation, very Hawking radiation it's called, very slowly, and it'll eventually shrink. And as it shrinks, it, it heats up and emits more and more. By shrinks, do you mean the, the, the horizon the gets horizon small? Gets, gets smaller. smaller yeah. Okay. Right. Um, and at some point, kind Hawking's calculation, which was based on this kind of semi-classical uh, general relativity, breaks down, and you can ask, like, what is the correct calculation at when Hawking's calculation breaks down? And no one has given a completely satisfactory answer to that. Um, uh, uh, and it's a really hard problem. And a lot of smart people have spent a lot of time thinking about it. Um, and so there are all kinds of, you can answer it in all kinds of toy models. Like I said, you know, a lot of what we do is we say, OK, I, this problem is too hard in the real world. So I'll we'll study a toy world where it's easy to solve. Yeah. So there are lots of toy models for black hole evaporation and quantum gravity in various contexts. And each toy model tells you some things, but it's unrealistic in other respects. And so, kind of you know, you, it, it, it depends how much of a cynic you are, how seriously you want to take any of the results that come out of those calculations. Um, but it's, I mean, it's certainly something that a lot of people have spent cumulatively a lot of time thinking about because it's a really important problem and if you come up with a, a like really convincing toy model that illuminates you know some aspects of that problem and really say oh you can say ah that's also what goes on in the real world and you win so do you knowing kind of all the physics you know and your vision of the real world and the toy different mm -hmm. simulations do you believe in god or or a creator you know not specific to any religion or i don't think anything in science points me in that direction um i, I mean i think that you know religion is a source of inspiration and comfort for a lot of people, and you know, in times of personal distress, I found comfort in the. Uh, so I'm I'm Jewish, and I found comfort in the rituals of Judaism, um, and that's great. Does it inform anything that I do as a physicist? Not really. 
right? So, um, yeah, I, I mean, you, you know, you, you look at the universe and you marvel at it and, you know, some people look at the universe and marvel at it and say, ah, the hand of God, right? And, you know, I say, ah, quantum field theory <laughs> or whatever. Um, right. Okay. So, so with all of the math that we have um, that we've kind of invented to describe mm -hmm. the phenomena in the universe, it, it, there's a lot that is predictable. There's a lot, mm -hmm. obviously, that isn't predictable. Um, do you think that taking all of this into account, it kind of points at there is some broad fundamental set of laws that describe everything that maybe we aren't capable of comprehending, but some higher being would be theoretically comparable of comp or a bit able to comprehend. And if so, do you think that suggests that we're in some kind of simulation versus, you know, who knows, like, so I think that the, I think that the world is, ultimately comprehensible. Otherwise, I would have just given up and like taken up some other occupation, right? Um, so I mean, because, you know, my job is to try to figure out the world. And if it's fundamentally not figure outable, you know, uh, I'm ultimately wasting my time. Um, so, you know, we'll, uh, you know, on the other hand, I do keep expecting new puzzles to crop up. And the history of physics is littered with instances of physicists thinking, ah, we finally understood everything. You know, very famously, you know, the, at around the turn of the 20th century, physicists really thought they'd understood everything. And then, you know, relativity, quantum mechanics, blah, blah, just burst that bubble, right? Um, so um, I'm certainly not of the opinion that you know, the final answer is right around the corner. In fact, I'm happy that it's not. Uh, as long as I'm able personally and we as, you know, scientists are able to continue making progress towards it, I'm fine with it being off in the distance. Um, you know, uh, uh, and I'm, I'd be uncomfortable if I thought we were close to the <laughs> final answer. Um, but I don't think we are. Um, now, as to a simulation, I think we get back to um, questions you asked earlier about like what's quantum computing good for. So the world's really quantum mechanical. As I said, um, classical computers are really lousy at simulating quantum mechanical systems. If you want to simulate a quantum mechanical system efficiently, you need a quantum computer. And so if we were in a simulation, I would contend it has to be a quantum simulation. And I'm hard pressed to imagine a quantum computer of the scale that would be needed to simulate our world. Hmm. Um, but, See, you know. I okay. feel, <laughs> on that one, I feel the opposite. Okay. I think it's almost certain that we are in some kind of a simulation. So I think you have to kind of take the term simulation and mm -hmm. extend that or, or tear it down to like what it really means at its root. Um, I guess there's not much of a distinction between the idea of a bigger creator and a simulation, because mm -hmm. what, what okay. is really yeah. the difference fundamentally. But the way that I see it is there are infinitely many potential paths that in one way or another, we are a simulation versus there's one path where this is it, right? right. Okay. So to me, it seems that alone kind of as you approach infinity with all those solutions becomes pretty mm -hmm. guaranteed in my head that we're in a simulation of some sort. Interesting. So in, in your simulation, just for argument's sake, is the world comprehensible? So, so this is the thing, right? So, so um, you know, n not only do I believe that we're, you know, going to discover the laws of physics that govern the world, but fundamental to that, is believing that there is is a set of laws that govern the world, right? Um, and 
No, you're not going to st suddenly start flying around the room, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. In a simulation, I don't know what prevents you from suddenly starting to fly around the room. Yeah, I mean, uh, if you take concepts like, you know, optimization problems mm -hmm. where you provide a set of constraints and you have, you know, this and that, it's hypothetically, if we do live in a simulation, I think in one way or another, we are subjected to some set of constraints. Okay. Clearly. Yeah. Um, I think there's a chance that math and physics and everything we're working towards is our best effort to kind of realize these constraints exist and do our best to describe them and see if we can find ways to take advantage of them or to understand them at like a higher level or, mm -hmm. or in, in whole. I don't know if it's possible to kind of comprehend the whole picture. Because it becomes, it's it's one of those things where it's like, could a fish in a fishbowl know it's in a fishbowl kind of thing? Mm -hmm. It's like, maybe, but like a very smart fish probably could figure out it's in a fishbowl. But, but at the same time, depending on like the fact that we're, if this is some sort of simulation with some set of constraints, we're obviously subjected to those constraints and were created by by mat as made up of matter that's inside this sort of constrained system. So I don't know if if that matter inside would be capable of conceiving of the broader overlying or bigger picture. I think it's useful regardless. So I'm not trying to say your no, job is totally useless you. <laughs> and your research is pointless and you know right. nihilism to right. the, to the moon. But right. I think there's value. It, if this is the case that we're in some sort of simulation and we're kind of just with no real capability of understanding everything, we're just kind of grasping at straws. I don't think that that necessarily makes the pursuit of it pointless because I think it's I think it's clear we've already reaped a, a lot of benefit from understanding physics and the world around us better and our idea of you know math or something to describe those phenomena, I think we've, we've benefited a lot, right? We've had marvels that 200, 300, 400 years ago, the idea of building a metal crate that just soars through the sky and then lands and everybody's safe on it and we can use that for yeah. trans, like that's crazy, that's absurd. Um, and I think without some of this pursuit of trying to understand the limits of what we're kind of these constraints are, we would never get there. So I do think that your job and, and your field is very valuable, regardless of this sort of answer. Um, but I do have doubts as to the idea that we are able to conceive of it all. Well, I mean, it, maybe. I, I mean, you know, when I run into the wall, either metaphorically or physically, <laughs> right, then I'll know, <laughs> right? Uh, but until then, I'm going to assume there's no wall there. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the wall fair. of the fishbowl, right? Right, right, right. So what do you think, what do you think technology is going to look like in, you know, a couple decades, a century from now? Do you think this exponential growth is going to, is kind of infinite until we sort of hit the fishbowl wall? Or do you think there's, we're going to kind of reach a point where it becomes more logarithmic as we get closer to that. Wow. I hope we don't destroy ourselves first. I mean, you know, there are lots of ways in which, you know, climate change and, you know, nuclear proliferation and, and you know, pandemics and all, all kinds of ways in which we could, you know, all die, right, uh, um, before that exponential levels off. Um, so I, I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic that, y you know, technology created most of these problems. I'm, I, I, I'm counting on technology to solve them. Um, mm. And if it doesn't, you, you know, the rest of the exponential is irrelevant. Uh, sure. Uh, so, yeah, I, 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 don't, I, I don't know. I mean... It will change, I, I think the, th the things that will change rapidly 
are not the things that I know how to predict, right? So no one expected to have a mainframe in your pocket, which is what you right. have, right? Right. Okay. Not only did they not expect that that would be possible, they didn't Con they couldn't conceive like why you would want the mainframe in your pocket. Like, what would you possibly do with it? You know, IBM I think famously expected to you know maybe sell a hundred computers or a thousand you know mainframes. You know, some ridiculously tiny number, I didn't right? Know that. Yeah, I, I mean, it just uh, I mean, an inconceivably right, tiny number, right? right? right. That, that was the, the the number of computers the world would need, right? Sure. Okay. So. Uh, um, you know, they're all, it's really, really hard to predict where technology is going to go and, and you know, fill niches that we can't even conceive of existing at the moment, mm -hmm. like that one. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, I think it's one of the, f one of the most hilarious things to me is when you look at some of those old movies from like the 20th century that will project the future and they'll see... Like, they'll get some things pretty right, and then they'll get some things just hilariously wrong. Like, I think uh, a good example of a movie I saw recently was, like, Blade Runner, the original uh -huh. one. Yep. This was, I don't remember when it came out, like, the 80s maybe or yeah, something well, like it that. Was, it was set in, like, 2019 or something 20, like that. Right. So yeah, it's sometime right. in the 21st century, right. and it was and created. they had flying cars. They, they had flying <laughs> cars. You know, some some of this stuff is very outlandish, but then they'll, mm -hmm. they'll have something like, they have a ton of screens, which they got right in the in mm -hmm. that we have a lot of screens, but they're all the the big boxy CRT TVs, screen, right, right, right. And I think that's hilarious that to them it's it's just a good example of like to them, they kind of saw that screens were a futuristic thing, but they couldn't even conceptualize the idea that we would get form factors right. insanely thin, right? Right. And and then you can do stuff like have one in your pocket. Right, right, right. You can can carry a CRT screen around, in, in, right? Yeah. Um, you, you know, you you have this breakthrough in technology where you can have a flat screen, and then you can put it in things that you would never have thought you want to put it in because it just wouldn't have. Right, and then you invent that. new use cases for right. that, and then you find thing. new use cases for that, and then everybody has to have one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, flying cars is one that's been all the movies for. Years and years and years and years, right? Right. That's an interesting one. Um, yeah. So, a kind of separate thing, but I had just I've just recently finally read the book 1984 for the first time. Oh wow! Okay. Have you you've yeah, read it? Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, one thing that that book made me really aware of was kind of what you were saying that we seem to be the biggest danger to ourselves, and. I think it's it's really easy. It depending like certain roles, certain functions in society, you obviously see it more, you're more privy to it. But I think it's pretty easy to kind of not realize some of what goes on in society and also like the direction that I think we're headed in a lot of ways. And so I like one of my favorite things to talk about is just social media and like some of that tech and the the trade we make with like our privacy and our data and mm -hmm. interaction with the real world into um, sort of like virtualization, VR type mm -hmm. stuff like that. Um, and it, it, a lot of it scares me a lot. Um, and I think there's, I think there's something to be said about some of the biological processes, processes that we sort of inherited genetically so things that will improve our mood like moving our mm -hmm. bodies and stuff mm -hmm. like that like it's like moving your body is becoming probably increasingly like less important from a function in society perspective and yet it has drastic impacts on like your mind and your happiness sure. and fulfillment um but yeah so analyzing kind of how that stuff is changing and where we're headed is something I really like to, to sort of do those thought experiments. So I'm curious from your perspective, how have you seen things like industry specifically, like academia and research, how have you mm -hmm. seen that kind of change from your perspective? Wow. Over time. Okay. So 
let me let me tell you when I started out doing research in physics, um, I was collaborating. So I was in Boston. I was collaborating with some folks uh, in the UK, and um, it used to take a week for email to get from the U.S. to the U.K. Jeez. A week. When was this? Um, Mid eighties. It took a week. Took a week. That's crazy. Uh, well, well, so I, I can explain that a little bit better because uh, in those days you could actually track the message. You get like little pingbacks telling you, you know, oh, it hopped from this server to that server, right? And so, you know, it went from Boston down to New York, and then across the Atlantic uh, on a 9600 baud transatlantic cable, and it eventually got to some server in the UK where it sat for days and days and days until it got sent on to the UK academic network and delivered to my friends at Oxford. <laughs> and I could wild. just watch it sit there, right, for days, right, for no earthly reason. Okay, so, you know, that's kind of, you know, how far we've come um, where we can video chat anyone anywhere in the world pretty much mm -hmm. um, in, in instantaneously um, so th th that's been that and and just the more broadly scientific communication uh, has just changed radically from you know when I was a student or you know beginning you know my physics career um, and it, it's allowed people to collaborate and exchange ideas and learn what other people have, what progress other people have made, you know, from everywhere in the world in, in, in a way that just was not possible when email took a week to get there, <laughs> right? And that was progress, because before then, we didn't even have email. Right, right, yeah. Have you seen a shift in priority from grants and things like that towards research that you kind of work in or away from it? Well, so now, y you know, everybody seems to be jumping on the machine learning bandwagon, right? If, if, if it has the phrase machine learning in it, you know, you're golden. Um, yeah, yeah, um, for, I don't know whether that's completely supplanted or only partially supplanted if it has the phrase quantum information in it, you're golden. Because uh, people were pouring billions of dollars into you know, quantum information, quantum computing efforts. Um, I never quite understood that for the reasons we discussed a little while ago. I mean, it's super interesting intellectually and Super important in certain niche things, but not something I'd spend billions of dollars on. Right. That's just me. If I were king, you know. Right, right, right. Priorities well, I think one of the big challenges, especially as you get more technical and in the physics realm specifically, is things become so niche and so difficult to conceptualize, especially for someone without that mm -hmm. Background and upbringing and research experience. So, how can someone in Washington or someone in private industry who's at the kind of the tippy top of some company mm -hmm. or whatever who makes those sh calls those shots? How is that person or entity going to effectively allocate money when really they need like a translation of a translation of a translation to even absolutely. understand what you're sending Ab money to do? Absolutely. So, y you know, uh, I'm personally funded by the NSF, right? And, and there's a pretty rigorous process of proposal reviews and then expert panels who take the re proposal review. And, and so there's a, you know, layers of experts who review you know, grant applications uh, and you know, make recommendations to the next layer right before it's it like gets a big to game the people who, a, who actually you know, allocate the money. Um, and so I think overall, I think that works generally pretty well, better than you almost expect, given that, yeah, it sounds like I'm describing broken telephones, but it works a little bit better than that, uh, maybe a lot better than that. Um, 
the, the real thing is, in the end, it's not a whole lot of money. Uh, I actually looked this up just for the fun of it. Um, one quarter of 1% of GDP in the U.S. is devoted to funding scientific research, and most of that is the National Institute of Health. Wow. One quarter of 1%. Jeez. Okay. Do you know other allocations, like how much of that goes to like defense contracting? Uh, you, you, can, you can figure out, you know, okay. we're a $25 trillion economy. You can look up, you know, sure, the, sure. the federal budget for, you know, 2022 and just divide by 25 trillion. You can, you can see how much went to what. Um, I mean, the federal budget's like a quarter of that, right? Just mm -hmm. to set the scale. Right, and and within the federal budget, you know, all of scientific research funding is Tiny. Well, it's like one percent. Right. So, do you think we would be making significantly faster advances with more funding, or do you think there's some sort of critical kind of? Well, so what happens? Uh, so what happens is, you know, the people who need funding to carry out their research have to spend more and more of their time chasing after grants, mm. which are harder and harder to come by, um, instead of devoting themselves full time to their research. Presumably, they'd make incrementally better progress if they were spending more time doing research and less time chasing after grants. So you think it's like an inefficiency thing? It's an inefficiency thing. It, it, you know, I'm not saying it's 100%, like if, you know, they, they um, if you, you doubled the amount of money you gave them, you they'd produce twice as right. much science. It's not linear, no, but... It's absolutely not linear, but it would certainly improve. There's some um, sort of degradation in efficiency yeah. by making the administrative processes of getting that funding more difficult, right. basically. Yeah. Um, and, and, you, you know, it, it, frankly, a, a lot of the progress in science um, happens because of young people, like people who are postdocs and like assistant professors. And you know, those are the ones with, they're young, they're full of ideas, lots of energy, right? And you know, a lot of them end up leaving the field, going off and working in finance or something, uh, just because you know, there's not a lot of, th they're supported by these grants and there's not a lot of money, so there's not a lot of support for them. So, mm. you know, they end up going off and doing something else. Gotcha. Do you think, um, kind of on that, you were saying so much of the industry's kind of, the ball is kind of moved forward by the younger generation. Uh, have you seen in recent years, or maybe the past decade or two, like a shift of more interest in the youth towards these areas or do you think we're seeing kind of a somewhat of an exodus away from some of these more science areas well so uh, i was talking to my, my my son just graduated from college uh, and uh, you know he, he was talking about you know the number of cs majors at both at his university and the other ones and it's you know astronomical right um and I think, you know, uh, 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 as a young person starting out, you know, uh, as I said, I was fell in love with physics at a very early age. Uh, if I were doing it all over again today, I might be in CS, right? Um, I don't know, maybe I'd still be in physics, but it, it, it's, it's, you know, there's a good chance I'd be doing something else. Um, so, I don't know. Uh, um, I, I think that we, the scientists, need to do a good job of, you know, letting the public know what's exciting advertising. and new, and, and advertising, because that's what gets people excited. Mm -hmm. That's what gets young people to say, "Hey, I want to do that too." Right. Yeah, I've seen a good amount of um, like interesting science-based content on on the different platforms mm -hmm. that I go on every now and then. It's so like YouTube, Instagram, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious because part of that has to fall on the shoulders of these big companies that sort of control some of the algorithms and what people get fed and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Like one of my big concerns coming from the tech side is 
these sort of like echo chambers that people get put in on different social media platforms right. across the board. So sometimes it's with like political ideology, but other mm-hmm. times it's, I mean, they just don't serve content that necessarily expands like interests and specifically within stuff like academics and science, like that can be like a tough thing to kind of navigate. I think one of the big issues from my perspective is the incentive structure of these companies, at least right now with the way that our industry is, with the way that privacy and laws are written, so on and so forth. It's like their sole incentive is to draw your attention to their platform for as long as possible. And that's the only thing that's going to maximize their top line revenue. So versus if we had some kind of, I don't know if this would look as a government program. I don't know if this would just be some sort of regulation or or what, but some way of maybe breaking that mold or changing that incentive structure. So more different topics and maybe scientific topics or topics that we've determined as a country or as a, a culture, um, like would be valuable to have the younger generations engage in, um, mm-hmm. and have more of that delivered to them. I think that would make a big difference. Well, I mean, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, I hesitate to say this, but one good thing I can say about Elon Musk is that, you know, he, he spent the money to shut Twitter down and thereby improving our civilization. <laughs> That's fair. Um, uh, so uh, I, I say that somewhat in jest, but you know there, there's this thing called Mastodon, right, which is this decentralized kind of Twitter-like platform, which a lot of people uh, that I know have moved to, you know, abandoning that particular social media platform in favor of this one, which is not just driven by the same kind of incentive structure that you were just describing. Right. So uh, in, in that sense, uh, I, I, I wasn't just joking uh, 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 about, you know, the, the what, what happened at, at Twitter. I mean, I think it actually uh, catalyzed a certain change in at least some people's behavior that could be to the good for the future. Mm. Right. Uh, I mean, there's no a priori reason why social media has to be controlled by these large conglomerates. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, this kind of uh, structure, the the model that, uh, you know, Mastodon works on is this kind of federated structure where you have a bunch of servers that are controlled by different people with their own set, each with their own set of rules that just talk to each other. Interesting. I've yeah. not heard of this platform. Oh, okay. So well, is this is it is it decentralized in the sense of like the kind of like a Web three sort of decentralization, or is it just smaller organizations that have been kind of stood up with the understanding that we're going to follow this kind of broader set of rules? So it, it it's two things. You know, so I don't know a whole lot about it because I'm not actually on it. But um, uh, uh, the, the way I, as I understand it, it works is is you know anyone the software is open source. Anyone can set up a a, a, a server, and okay. people so more, can, can more people can join, right? Uh, and the 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 key feature, the thing that makes this work, is that they're not just talking to who's ever is on, on that particular platform, but they can, they're they federated, so they can exchange So m- other more in pl- like the Web3 kind of decentralization. It, it, that model. kind of decentralization. Okay, cool. Because, right. uh, yeah, I was going to say, I think the two, there's really only two approaches, three maybe approaches, to kind of fixing this issue of some of the social media stuff. One is governmental intervention and force, right. which in general tends to be sketchy i would say the second would be to increase competition to the point where they have to cater more to the to the user to the customer um that could work but the problem with that is if there's more and more more platforms there's only a finite number of people and people want to be on the platforms that their friends are on so that makes it that very tough so then i think the third option i can even think of would be some sort of decentralization where it's one big platform but again, the decentralization prevents like one right. ruling or governing body over it. Well, that's uh, like I said, that's the way it's c- 
conceived, that's the way it seems to work. It, of course, doesn't have anything like the scale of Facebook or Twitter or you know, any, any of the, the big social media platforms. But in principle, it could grow. Um, you know, and because it, it has this federated model, it's not like you're cut off from mm -hmm. the rest of the community. There's this wider community that can exchange information with each other. So, in and, 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 and why that's nice is that um, it lowers the barrier to entry so that it's not just some big multi-billion dollar corporation that can run the thing, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, uh, hopefully those types of platforms start to crop up a bit more and we can reimagine some of the way that it works right now because I think it's pretty dangerous the way it works right now, but maybe it's just growing pains and like that's how we kind of figure out the better way to go. Um, okay, so this is kind of an out there question, okay. but based on all of the work you've done and you know the life you've lived so far what to you is the meaning of life oh wow um so what i would like to do is make a, a positive difference in the world right that somehow or other the world is better off for my having been here than it otherwise would have been, right? Um, and different people, different skill sets and abilities and predilections may find different paths to, to doing that. But, you know, my hope is that, you know, each of us does something that leaves the world a better place than we found it. Um, so, you know, my personal thing is, first of all, I'm a teacher, you know, I'm training the next generation of scientists and engineers and whatnot. Um, and I'm also trying to you know, expand the boundaries of what we know about physics and mathematics. Um, and you know, it's, that's a very enjoyable pursuit because when you discover something, it's very exciting and, and pleasing. Um, and hopefully, you know, in 50, or a hundred years time or whatever, there's something that I've done that someone will remember. Um, still dreaming about that. Sure. Well, I think that's probably the best way to kind of be immortal in some sense, right? Is to have your influence in some way be carried on through those generations. Um, I think that's a good answer. I think that's also an answer that, um, in general, is obtainable and um, maybe answers the, why aren't you just nihilistic knowing what you know and you know the scale of things and everything. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I would say from, from my perspective, it has to do definitely partially with that, um, but also with I think I do a very poor job of this in general, um, and I think a lot of our society is geared towards doing a poor job at this, um, but living in kind of the present and just kind of existing. Because at the end of the day, the concept of the future and the past are just concepts, right? The only right. thing that really exists if you want to get all philosophical and tear right. down everything is, uh -huh. is this moment in like the present. So I think one thing is for me is trying to maximize and really like lean into that. I think we certainly invented the concepts of future and past and you know all that stuff with good outcomes and, and intentions and use cases and we get a lot out of sitting down and planning what we're going to do for the day or sitting mm -hmm. down and you know making sure we're on the right path for 10 years from now. But I I try I've been trying at least I should say mm -hmm. to to kind of do more of that living in the moment and in the present. And then also the, the connecting with people piece and interacting with people. I think at some fundamental level, my appreciation and fulfillment I get from those connections comes from um, 
a similar place as what you were saying mm -hmm. of, of kind of leaving the world a better place or creating a better place in that that connection is kind of inherently, I think, what we as humans um, value and grow from and appreciate. So part of it is kind of contributing in that sense, but also just, I don't know, just sharing in that experience, right? Because this is like, it's a pretty weird thing when you really think about it like all this stuff and you look up at the stars and knowing that there's whatever a hundred billion galaxies mm -hmm. and a hundred billion whatever stars mm -hmm. whatever it it kind of becomes um i don't know just it's it's a very bizarre situation to just wake up and find yourself in this world and uh i think as such just sharing in that experience and being grateful that you have other people or other beings um, to kind of experience it with is, is huge. Amen.